Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all participants joining from different parts of the world. My name is Shireen, and I work with Peace Vigil. It is my pleasure to invite you all to today's session on mental well being with the fabulous Samir Dosani. Peace Vigil works on peace education. Our motto is peace needs all of us, which means that individual and collective actions by the so-called common people are paramount in the protection and promotion of peace. Peaceful coexistence of different communities depends on the large scale practicing of a culture that accepts and celebrates diversity promotes mutual understanding and dialogue, and invests in an education which discourages bigotry. Peace Vigil works to establish such a culture with its various programs. You can learn more about us through our YouTube channel and through our website. Sami is going to show you that page again with the information, but the channel is called Peace Vigil on YouTube and the website is www peacevigil.net. You can also access our podcast called Baobab, Redwood and Neem on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts. You have my email address in the communication I sent to you, but I will repeat it here, s-h-i-r-i-n at peacevigil.net. So it's shireen at the rate peacevigil.net and you're more than welcome to write to me with any questions regarding today's program or about Peace Vigil in general. Uh, so today we will be learning how to optimize our mental health with Samir Dosani. As a peace education organization, we are invested in the mental health of the community and therefore we hold trainings on the subject. This training is also available in Hindi language accessible on our channel and to limited parts of the world in French. We are fortunate that Peace Vigil's own Sami Dosani is an expert in the field of health and nutrition, and therefore we have an in-house resource person on the subject. Sami, of course, doesn't need much introduction as his work on physical and mental health has received so much praise on social media in the last couple of years. Uh, but just as a reference, I will read a small introduction. Sami Dosani is a certified health and nutrition coach from uh, the Health Coaches Academy, United Kingdom. He has also worked in senior positions at various international organizations like the Amnesty International, ActionAid International and Oxfam on public policy, including public health policy and health services. His booklet on his basic philosophy on health can be, um, um, can be accessed on Amazon. It is available there and it is called the Health Dialectic. It is an extremely reasonably priced book so that all can access it. He also has a lovely and very popular podcast called Recovery and Transformation, and he has his own YouTube channel as well. I now invite Sami to speak, and we will have a question and answer uh, session at the end, so you can ask questions at the end of the training. Have a lovely learning experience, everyone. Sami Dosani, over to you. Thank you so much, Shireen. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. So welcome, everyone. Um, thanks again, Shireen, for the introduction. So uh, as I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, we have actually quite a lot of work to get through. I consider, you know, I consider, you know, the framing for this discussion is that um, there was a time maybe in my parents' generation or certainly in my gen grandparents' generation where no matter what you had been through, no matter what life had thrown to you, you were expected to sort of tough it out and deal with it. And, and concerns about mental health were not, they were there certainly, but it was not culturally appropriate to talk about that. Uh, we're not at that point in time anymore, I'm pleased to say. And I think mental health is something that we all need to work to improve. Even we may be in great mental health, we may consider that we are the most grounded people on the planet. Still, we must do our best to improve our mental health. Just some talk. So because this is a Peace Vigil event, and at Peace Vigil events, we're always about taking action. What can we do to support ourselves and our community? I just want to say these are some of the outcomes that we're expecting from today's session. Uh, we're expecting you to take home after today's session. So we'd like you to take some action and we'll talk in, be talking about very specific actions, but something to protect the mental health of yourself and your community. That's number one. Number two, um, it would be great if you could be part of a community that engages in dialogue for peace. 
And Shirin is more than happy to talk to you about that if you contact her by email, what that should look like. Um, three, this is an interactive space. Um, I have enabled the chat and you are encouraged to use that feature. We will, as Shirin said, someone will be monitoring that chat and letting me know uh, as questions come up. Follow-up queries, as Shirin said, can be sent to that email address. Uh, we have a Facebook group, we, which we would encourage you to join called Good Things Happen Too. We try to post good stories of peace. Um, there's a bias towards India, uh, but you know, peace anywhere in the world, you're more than welcomed to post those stories um, in that Facebook group and to have discussions. And of course, we have a YouTube channel, um, Peace Vigil on YouTube, just do a search and you'll see us there. You'll see this I, that is the, uh, the sign that we use. Okay, so um, let's begin by talking about the, um, the nervous system. So the brain is a complicated organ. It's connected to all the other organs through something called the central nervous system. CNS, uh, some of you may be familiar with that abbreviation. abbreviation. So one part of the brain uh, is the reward sy system. This is what gives us pleasure. Sometimes these are called happiness hormones. Now happiness or pleasure are fairly broad terms, but when we look at it, each of these hormones are doing very specific things in our brain and in our body. Dopamine is associated with mostly with addiction, right? So mice who have the option of pushing a button, so you put a, mice in a, a mouse in a lab, you hook up a little electrode to the brain, and when that mice pushes the button, uh, it, or that mouse pushes the button, it will receive dopamine. Now, those unfortunate mice, they push that button until they die. They, they're getting pleasure hit after pleasure hit. They forget to eat. They forget to sleep. They die very, very quickly. Okay? But dopamine is not just about addiction. It's critical also for motivation. So those who experience deficiencies in dopamine have difficulty even getting out of bed. So dopamine is really what motivates us to go out and seek the reward. So I think sometimes we get a little bit confused. We think that dopamine is what you get when you receive the heroin or whatever it is, the, the drug. Um, that's not the case. Dopamine is what is motivating you to go out and get that, okay? Uh, endorphins, which you'll see here, there are a whole class of hormones. So it, those of us who remember the, the 80s and the 90s, we were told, you know, you got to jog, you got to do these exercises for your endorphins and so on. Um, when I looked into it, I found that even I, who I felt like I, I'd done a lot of research on this prior to this presentation, but it, you know, when I made this presentation, I realized, okay, I didn't know there are 20 different kinds of endorphins. And these are all different chemicals that reduce pain. So yes, endorphins are often associated with exercise. Uh, we release endorphins when we are exercising so that we can complete the tax, task. rather. So if you think of what humans would have had to go through in nature, so if you think about, say, a hunt, a hunt is not an easy task, and it's a sense of delayed gratification. You have to work a whole lot to maybe get something at the end, right? Now, some of the communities we work with here in the Kalahari in Africa, they engage in something called persistence hunting, which is a process that can take a whole day or sometimes even longer. So you can imagine that, you know, a whole day of hunting, you know, this is not easy, walking, running, et cetera, that can be pretty painful. So it's useful that the body makes its own painkillers. Those are the endorphins. Endo meaning within the body and morphine, like, uh, you know, morphine is morphine, same thing. So anything made from poppy seeds. So it, it gives you that same sense, um, but without the poppy seeds, right? Uh, oxytocin is considered a, a trust right. hormone. Uh, it's very important for relationships, especially romantic relationships. Uh, we won't go further than that today. I mean, I, I think it is important to say that, you know, mothers who uh, don't produce, who are, or, or, I'm talking about now animals again, animal experiments, you can genetically um, experiment so that a mother won't produce oxytocin and that mother will basically abandon her child, right? So oxytocin is what is really the hormone that's binding us together in relationships, if that makes any sense. Um, serotonin is in some ways um, the opposite of do dopamine. In, in other words, what I said was dopamine is what sort of motivates you to go out and seek that, say, a drug or that the kind of rewarding behavior. Dopamine uh, is about pursuing. Serotonin is about, about being content. So once you actually get the food or the drug or whatever it may be, you'll get a hit of serotonin. And some people who have a lot of serotonin are content and happy with where they are. Uh, you don't want too much of this because uh, you know you can imagine someone who's just flooded with serotonin, they're never going to get out of bed. They're never going to have any motivation to do anything at all. So proper mental health is a balance between these various hormones. 
Um, what is mental illness? Well, I, I went and looked it up in the dictionary for this presentation, and the dictionary had a very unhelpful uh, definition, which I will which I will share here. Whatever causes a disorder in thinking or behavior is defined as a mental illness. Okay, I mean, fine. Um, one thing that I'll say about um, mental illness is that so so one thing before we go further is just to say how common it is, right? In India, more, more than one in seven people will suffer some form of mental illness in their lifetime. To promote this, uh, in the last couple of days, many of you would have seen that I put a statistic that 80% of people in Denmark were on uh, a, some kind of a mood enhancing medication, mood changing medication. So um, in Denmark, of course, it's much, much worse. But even in India, the prevalence of mental illness has more or less doubled between 1990 and 2017. Uh, similar trends can be seen in other countries, like I say, um, including the U.S., where one in five will suffer from some form of mental illness during their lifetime. Now, when diagnosing mental illness, we have a very strange problem, um, and this is the problem that I put here. The symptoms are the proof of the disease. Uh, what does that mean? So, so for most diseases, let's take diabetes, for example. For diabetes, my symptoms may be that I'm gaining weight and say I have some nerve pain in my fingers and toes, yeah? Um, the weight gain and the, the pain in my fingers and toes, that is a symptom of the diabetes. And diabetes is defined in very clear terms. If you have a blood sugar of over 6.2 or 6.5, whatever the, the regulation is in your country, um, you are defined as being a type 2 diabetic, right? So very clear definition. But for mental illness, the only way we get the diagnosis is to have the symptoms. Um, there's nothing that determines a diagnosis of cl clinical anxiety, for example, other than the patient is feeling anxious, right? And for me, that's a problem. Uh, what can cause mental illness? Uh, well, in a word, it's um, it's trauma. Sorry, I'll get to the medicine thing in a second. Um, the thing is that nearly all of us have trauma. So trauma is defined, you know, if we look at uh, Gabor Mate's work on this, anything, you know, for example, not picking up an infant when he or she cries, that can be defined as trauma, right? And in, in that definition, almost all of us have some sort of trauma, but not all of us go on to develop mental illness. Um, so trauma is a necessary but not a sufficient condition to cause that mental illness. And of course, not all uh, mental illness and not all trauma is the same, right? Um, so there, you know, in terms of treatment, we have different forms of treatment of mental, health, mental illness. Um, there are medications that tend to try to address a hormone imbalance. So this was done, there was some time ago, there was a class of medications that was actually developed uh, to treat um, epilepsy, to treat people who get seizures. Um, and what it was found was people who take, took that, somehow their, their move, mood improved. Um, so it was thought that, and, and it was thought that the mechanism was that it was increasing the amount of serotonin uh, in the brain, which it does. Um, but the problem is um, that has a very temporary effect. In other words, you know, when you give SSRIs to someone for a day, for a month, for a year, even it has some effect or for many people, it can have some positive effect. Um, but that effect tends to wear off year by year by year by year. In fact, if you look at the, the package, most of these medicines, it's not recommended you take them longer than three months. And many of us, I think all of us would at least know someone who's been on these medications for many years. Um, there's also talk therapy. Um, this is when you go to a therapist and you talk. Um, traditionally, the therapist is just meant to listen. Um, what I would just say for those of us who are in the space of trying to make the world a better place, all of us here, um, you know, it's, you know, when we talk about trauma, it's important to understand that we're all carrying trauma, as I say. It may be physical trauma. So some of us may have been, you know, beaten up by the police or whatever it is, but it's much more commonly emotional trauma that's inherited from our parents who in turn inherited it from their parents. Um, and the, the colonial system that we're all part of pressures us to become sort of automatons, to become machines instead of fully well-rounded human beings. And trauma is one of the ways in which that happens, right? So uh, what is really going on? Well, um, there's a new book out by Dr. Chris Palmer from Harvard. Um, very interesting person, and I would encourage you if, you, if you can buy the book, great. If you'd like to look at some of his YouTube videos, you can probably figure out everything that's in the book just by listening to him. Um, what he's arguing is that yes, trauma is real. And one way of understanding mental illness is as a kind of trauma. But what we see in patients with mental illness, so all kinds of mental illness from the least serious to the most serious, is that they are also more likely to suffer from metabolic disease. 
So that means diabetes and obesity, but it also means cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, dementia, et cetera. Now, mental disorders are metal, metabolic disorders of the brain. This is what he's arguing, right? Um, by the way, that, that correlation goes the other way. So if you have, say, diabetes, you're more likely to develop mental illness. If you have mental illness, you are more likely to develop diabetes. So the, the relationship goes in both ways. Um, so what Chris Palmer is arguing is that the brain is having problems processing energy. Uh, there can be many reasons for this, but the most common is insulin resistance. Um, what I refer to in my book is hyperinsulinemia. Um, that's the root cause of diabetes, but there are a lot of other things going on too. Um, I won't get into too many technical details here, but once we understand that this is fundamentally about an energy imbalance, we can begin to prescribe certain lifestyle changes that will improve our mental health. And if we want to get even deeper, it's about mitochondria and how we keep those mitochondria healthy, right? Um, so I just want just a word on mitochondria um, before, before we move on to sort of the practical part of this um, presentation. So mitochondria, it's thought, the current theory is that you had a kind of cell, a kind of an amoeba-like cell, right? And you had a bacteria-like cell. So if you look at a, an amoeba, it's sort of roundish, it's sort of amorphous. Um, and bacteria are much more square. They look like this. And for some reason, these two things formed a symbiotic relationship. Some, I'm forgetting the exact figure, 2.4 or 2.5 billion years ago. So this is a long, long time ago. Um, and that symbiotic relationship is at the heart of all life. Mitochondria, you, will, you may have heard of as being the powerhouse of the cell. Um, it does, they do much more than that. They're very, very important. And at the root of this metabolic theory of disease and mental illness, is that we are mitochondria are becoming dysfunctional. So I just want to say from a sort of peace educator point of view, it's actually quite interesting to think that you know two species, all of nearly all life on earth that currently exists, especially complicated life beyond single-celled organisms, is a result of this symbiotic relationship between two single-celled organisms. So these are creatures that would usually fight. For some reason they decided to live together in peace. And, you know, as a result of that, you have creatures, everything from an insect to a whale has uh, mitochondria at its, at its heart and plants and everything else, right? Um, so before we move ahead, please go ahead and use that chat function. Uh, does anyone want to guess uh, what tends to be the single biggest in intervention we can do in terms of lifestyle to improve mental health? So we're going to, we're shifting gears here. We're going to, um, we're going to talk about, um, practical things you can do. Uh, Mitsu says diet. Um, Melissa also says diet. These are all good guesses. I think people know the kinds of things that I usually talk about. So with most of my clients, absolutely. The first thing we're going to talk about is diet. There's an exception though. If someone comes um, and, and wants to talk about their mental health, I don't go to diet first. Where do I go first? Take another guess. Don't be shy. Um, you know, we are all friends here. No one's judging anyone. Feel free exercise. to write. Yeah, exercise. Kyle, Shaker, you guys have it completely right. Um, uh, right, 100%. So, so if someone is coming to me with, with a mental health concern, exercise tends to be the single biggest intervention we can do. It's the single thing we can do that will really make an improvement. Um, most of the studies that demonstrate this tend to be about running, walking, or other forms of cardiovascular exercise. Um, but based on my own um, experience now working with a lot of clients by now, um, it can be almost anything. Like it doesn't have to be, you know, if someone comes to me with a, a some kind of mental health concern, I'll say, look, how do you feel about increasing exercise? And they say, yeah, I'm open to it. Then I'll say, look, um, what do you like to do? <laughs> do you like to do you like to play tennis? Do you like to lift weights? Do you like to go swimming? Um, what moderate exercise, 20, 30 minutes a day seems to be enough to get the mental health benefits. So we're not necessarily talking about a lot, um, but it could be as simple as a, a brisk walk. It could be doing some push-ups and sit-ups at home. It could be going to the gym and working with a trainer. Um, it's not necessary, but the, the advantage of doing the gym thing is, um, having a community sort of keeps you accountable and it can also improve mental health in other ways. And some of the other ways that we're going to get into a little bit later in the presentation. Um, so next, yes, indeed, uh, Mitsu and um, one other person was right, that the next thing we are going to talk about is a species-appropriate um, diet, right? Um, so I think the first thing to say about the food, um, the food discussion, I should say, is much longer than the exercise discussion because 
It's a lot more, it's a lot more complicated. Um, but it's important to point out that we're living in a unique food environment. We have access to food, like a lot of food, 24 hours a day. Our ancestors would never have had that. Um, so sugar in particular is very toxic. Um, I mean, in, you can see how the body reacts to sugar. It has to pack it away very, very quickly. Um, so sugar in the bloodstream is toxic. And when we have chronically high levels of sugar in the blood, the body has to adjust. It adjusts by raising the insulin levels, right? So, um, and chronically high insulin levels can cause all kinds of other problems. So your cells are stuffed. Your body can't use the nutrients um, that's become, um, so, so when insulin is high, um, your body is always packing the suitcases. So think of the cells, especially the fat cells and, and even the glycogen cells, even muscle cells, think of them as like empty suitcases. And insulin is, is like the, the, the robot, the commander, the, the, the captain, or if you want to think about it, the mother. Mother's telling you to pack your suitcase because your stuff is all over the room, right? So you're packing your suitcase, but at some point your suitcase gets stuffed, but mother's still there telling you to pack your suitcase. And you can't take anything out of it. You can't clean it as long as insulin levels are high. Um, it will never use the fat stores that your body has, and it can engage with cleaning mechanisms like autophagy and apoptosis. Um, so when it comes to practical recommendations for what we can do, uh, I think it kind of depends on where you are in your health and your mental health uh, spectrum, right? If you think your mental health is pretty good and you just want to maintain, uh, you might be able to get by just with some carb restriction. So in the Indian context, this means limiting the amount of roti or rice you might have with your meals. Here in Africa, it may be more about the pup, the, the uh, porridges and the millets and so on. You may want to reduce some of those. Um, but if your mental health is not great, then you would definitely have to eliminate some of these foods and maybe work with a nutrition or health coach to, act, to actually formulate a ketogenic diet. Um, ketogenic diets are very low carb diets, uh, high in fat, and they've been shown to reverse a number of health related conditions, starting with epilepsy, which is what they were designed to treat, uh, but now many other health conditions as well. So we have bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and much more. Chris Palmer's book goes over in quite a lot of detail. Um, a lot of the some case studies from his own practice. So remember, he's at Harvard. He's a researcher, but he's also a clinical psychologist. He has case studies from his own practice, but he also goes over all the research, uh, the, the previous trials that have shown that ketogenic diets um, can can really really um, improve mental health outcomes and and very serious mental uh, mental health um, issues such as schizophrenia and more. Right? Okay. Next question. So let's say, for the sake of argument, you really wanted to destroy your mental health. Um, what is the quickest way you you could destroy your mental health? Any guesses? So <clears throat> the quickest way by far to destroy your mental health is, uh, sorry, sorry, before I do that, before we do that, let's go back to food. Sorry, these are three practical recommendations that many of you uh, may be familiar with. So simple, reduce your carbohydrates, prioritize protein, don't fear dietary fat, you'll be in a good shape. And by dietary fat, we, we mean sort of ancestral fats, fats that your, your grandparents would recognize butter, lard, tallow, et cetera, um, maybe olive oil as well. Okay, so getting back to that question, what is the quickest way to destroy your mental health? Um, stop sleeping, Kyle has absolutely the right answer. Sleep is in some ways the most important part of the equation because without sleep, we very quickly lose our mental health. Um, there's a lot of data on this, which we don't need to go over. So I love these studies because they're all like, um, in the 1950s and 60s, the US Army wanted to see you know, if their people were put under, you know, psychological torture. So they tortured their own people. I don't know. I don't know why they did this. They tortured like 20 year old boys. They made them go like 48, 72 hours without sleep. Uh, and it's really horrific like to see, to see the results um, of, of uh, what happened with that. Anyway, so it, it's the most important part of the equation because without sleep, we lose our mental health. Um, instinctively, I think many of us understand this. On a day when we haven't slept enough, we just don't feel right. If we go two nights in a row without proper sleep, we have trouble even think, you know, forming a thought, right? So some quick tips to help with sleep. Um, number one, have a bedtime. Um, so try and sleep at the same time every night. Number two, uh, try and put away your screens at least 30 minutes before sleeping. To tell you the truth, 30 minutes probably isn't enough. But I find when I tell people to stop looking at their screens two hours before bedtime, they're not going to do it. So 30 minutes is what I've come up with as a realistic target. If you can do an hour or, or more, better. Um, 
And, you know, good sleep begins in the morning. So in the morning, we want you to try and get out, get into the sun within 30 minutes of waking up. At the moment, it's a bit challenging here in South Africa, because if I wake up at, say, six o'clock, the sun doesn't rise till seven. Um, but as soon as you can try and get some some sun exposure, some sunlight into your eyes, this is how the body resets and it knows the daylight cycles. And that's related to the next thing we're going to talk about, which is uh, light and darkness. So, uh, you know, sleeping in a dark environment is very important, but light is also very important. So um, historically, our light would have been regulated by just one thing, the sun. Yeah. Me too, saying the UK is starved on light and sunshine. Most of the year you are, yes, but at this time of year, you I think you have sunlight at 9, 9 p.m. And, and 4 a.m. or 3 a.m. I'm not sure when it's rising. So, uh, so enjoy it while it lasts. Um, in the last 1.5 million years, humans have learned to manipulate fire. So that's changed our relationship with light. Um, but nothing, of course, has changed our relationship with light as much as the past 100 or 150 years with the light bulb, right? And now we have LED lights, we have computer screens, we have iPhone screens, we have you know all this kind of stuff, iPads. So it's a whole new level. Um, a lot could be said about this, but just in terms of tips, let me keep it simple. Uh, during the day, try to spend some time outdoors. Getting sunlight on your skin is great for mood. It's great for vitamin D production. It's great for a lot of things. Uh, nitric oxide, for those who want to get into the biology of it. Um, during the evening, Try to put away those phones and computers, dim your lights or use a red light if you can. Um, you can also get fancy blue, blue light blocking glasses. Um, and if you have to spend time on your computer in the evening, it may be a good idea to invest in something like that. To tell you the truth, the latest studies I've seen show that those fancy glasses don't do very much, um, especially if you can get out and get some sunlight into your eyes um, during the daytime. Because what matters is the difference between the, the the daytime sun and the nighttime light, the daylight and the nightlight. So as long as you're getting out in the sunshine, I'm less concerned about the blue light blocking glasses. Samir, uh, just to interrupt here for a second, could you explain a little bit more about why red light during sleep uh, helps us if there's a red light, if, yeah. if we need light? Yeah, to tell you the truth, I, I'm... Um, for sleep, so 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 again, looking at the um, our evolution. So um, our our ancestors first discovered fire. It's thought 1.5 million years ago, but only really started using it maybe about 200,000 years ago. And humans are only 250,000 years old. So that's a significant part of our evolution. And when you look at traditional cultures, these activities by firelight are extremely important. Like they're they're like what keeps the society together. All of, all of your things are happening. In the daytime, you have to take advantage of the daylight to go hunt and gather and do other things. The nighttime, it's not safe to be doing those things. There are predators around. So everyone comes together. So it's thought, and, and this is where science doesn't have all the answers. It has some of the answers. But it's understood that that U, red light in the UV spectrum, so some red light that we can't even see, but some that we can see, um, is really helping us out infrared and red light. It's it's doing a lot of things to regulate our sleeping patterns, to make us ready for sleep. Um, also has you know benefits for uh, even the skin and, and many other things. So the short answer is we don't know all of the benefits, but it seems to have a lot of benefits, exposure to these red lights, um, especially in the evening. Does that answer your question? Um, yes, I, I think in the last workshop we did in Hindi, some um, you know you had explained that also uh, for safety purposes, people used to have some fire, you know, like when they used to sleep in caves and all. Just um, you know, they they had that as a safety precaution, and I think that signals to people that it is night time and it's, it's time to unwind. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, even if you go to the the communities that that you and I have visited in the Kalahari. They, when they're asleep in the in the forest, they keep the fires on a light all night. They have to, otherwise the predator they fear predators, uh, rightfully so. Thank um, you. That's a good point. Okay. Um, okay. So hot and cold exposure is the next thing I wanted to talk about. Um, there have been a number of studies showing the benefits from getting uncomfortably hot or uncomfortably cold for a short period of time. Um, so I think the best data on this indicates that spending time in a sauna can be incredibly beneficial for most people. Uh, saunas can be expensive or inaccessible. So one thing to do that's much easier is when you finish uh, your shower or your bath to finish with cold water. 
Um, some studies, in fact, I would say most studies show that you don't need a lot of exposure to cold to get some benefits. Um, as little as one minute of exposure to cold uh, can really have a very powerful impact on mental health. And again, this is one of the things, if you ask me why, I don't know why exactly this is complicated, but it really does seem to lead to better mental health outcomes to have some kind of exposure to either heat or cold or both. Uh, what I do when I go to the gym, I'll try and spend maybe 10 or 15 minutes in a sauna as hot as I can bear. And then I'll go straight into a cold shower and, and that's, that's me done then. Um, okay, couple of things fairly quickly. Um, social relations are, um, you know, and healthy relationships are super important for mental health. As we get older, this isn't just about uh, romantic par partners. It's also about having a group of friends that you can rely on. So um, for men, the studies show in terms of mental health benefits, it's better to have sort of a, a, a core group of mental of male friends who you can sort of hang out with. And for women, it's the same. For women, it's it's about having a core group of um, female friends who you can trust and confide and have discussions with. Um, there's a huge body of literature that associates loneliness with mental illness, and in fact, with physical illness as well. Um, there's also interesting literature in Japan about what they're what they call forest bathing. I'm forgetting the Japanese term for it, but but this is um, is a whole literature about you know you're living in Tokyo and you go and you bathe in the nearby forest for a couple of hours. Um, and uh, people who found uh, spent as little as one or two hours a week in that kind of nature, they saw significant improvements in their mental health. Um, again, if you're asking me why, I don't think I have the answer here, um, but it's fascinating to know that definitely that there's a very strong signal there. It's not something that can be dismissed. So forest bathing, super interesting, super important if you can do it. Um, the next thing we're going to do is some breath work. So, uh, you know, it seems obvious to say, but um, breathing is extremely powerful, right? So, so uh, in order to understand this, we have to talk a little bit about the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is the part of the nervous system that we don't have to think about. So our heart beats without thinking about it, right? Our liver does whatever it does. The liver does a lot of functions without us thinking about it at all. Uh, the breath is, you know, if you don't think about the breath, it'll function as well. You don't have to think about breathing to breathe but you can control it if you want to. And we breathe without thinking most of the time, right? So that's why it's so important. Um, there are two states of the autonomic nervous system. This slide may be familiar to um, Peace Vigil uh, followers. So we've talked about this before in the context of um, hate between communities and how it's, it's very difficult to have a conversation with someone if they're, in, if they're in fight or flight here, if they're in the sympathetic nervous system. So, but just to say there's two parts of the autonomic nervous system. You have Sympathetic, which is often referred to as fight, flight, or freeze, this is, or sometimes fight or flight. And you have the parasympathetic, which is sometimes referred to as rest and digest. I won't go through all of this, but, but you get the basic idea, right? Um, now, breathing is super important because it's one way you can transition between these states. Right? So if we breathe as if we were chased by a lion, so imagine that you're being chased by a lion and you start to breathe as if you're doing that, your body will actually start to act like that. You can activate the sympathetic nervous system, even though you're in no danger, just by controlling your breath. Yeah. And conversely, if you breathe as if you're completely relaxed, there's no threat, right? Um, there's an evenness to our breath, or if we spend longer on the exhales than on the inhales, our body will relax and we can engage the para parasympathetic nervous system. Um, so to illustrate this point, if we have time shooting, I thought we might do a quick exercise or should we skip, skip the exercise today? I'm just gonna teach everyone a very quick breathing exercise, not difficult. Four, seven, eight, the principle is quite simple. So you breathe in for four seconds, you breathe, you hold it for seven seconds and you breathe out for eight seconds. I would like, uh, if you're in a position, of course, if you're driving or something, you know, you can watch this later. As I said, it's on Facebook. But uh, if you if you're not driving, if you're just relaxed, looking at your phone or whatever, feel free to do this uh, with me. Um, Shirin, are you going to demonstrate as I as I count? Yes. Okay, fantastic. So, um, four, seven, eight, breathing. So you breathe in for four, you hold for seven, and you breathe out for eight. Are you ready, Shirin? Yes, I am. So inhale two, three. Four, hold two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Inhale two, three, four, 
hold two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One more time. Inhale, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is a very, very simple breathing exercise that we use, um, especially for people who may be suffering from a bit of uh, anxiety. Um, so let's get into that. Um, this is what anxiety looks like. So, so you feel um, worried, tense, helpless, scared. Um, you can always use these breathing exercises to try and get yourself back there. You can drink some water. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of us um, get into problem solving mode a little bit too quickly. So we think, oh God, something's happened. I need to fix it. Um, maybe, maybe you need to fix it, but just take a second to sort of collect yourself first um, before you um, before you before you take action. Um, and then see if you can involve other people. If you can, if you can bring a community into this, you're going to be much more effective, and and that will reinforce the idea that you're not alone. Anxiety and during anxiety attacks, our tendency is to think that we are all alone, but we have to remember we have friends, we have family, we have support networks, um, you know, or we can build them. We can use this opportunity to call someone who maybe is not that close a friend, and we call them up and we say, I, I just need some help talking this through. Can I please can I talk this over with you? And 99 times out of 100, that person will say yes. And then maybe that may, you know, that person may be part of your support group in the future. So um, it's important to understand these things. Did you uh, want to Samir, say something? Here? Also, um, there was a point about dehydration, I think, that we missed. Ah, yes. So um, often, you know, it's, it's an, when we have these symptoms, so sometimes the first thing that we really need to do is to hydrate. Because there is some kind of there may be some kind of an electrolyte imbalance that is actually making things worse, and so trying to drink that water ideally with some electrolytes, with some some salt in there at the very minimum. But if you can get salt, potassium, maybe a little bit of magnesium, um, that would be great. Uh, if you need electrolyte recipes, I can post them um, uh, later on today if you like. Um, is that good? Shall we move on to depression? Uh, yes. And for depression also, you have a different breathing technique, right? That that helps. Not really. Um, the problem is that, you know, I, I think I think with uh, depression, what's the situation? The situation is that it's actually in some ways the opposite of anxiety, right? So, so you you your ability to get that dopamine hit, your ability to find motivation is really attacked. So uh, breathing is not actually, uh, usually for most people, I, 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 there's always exceptions, so I can't say things universally. But for most people, breathing is not going to be how we get, how we deal with depression. What we're going to have to do is we're going to have to ask ourselves some tough questions. Are we making life too easy for ourselves? Um, it's tough to hear that when you're in a situation when you can't get out of bed. Um, but it's important to sort of ask that question just in the sense of, you know, is there something you can do? Are you, you know, are you getting too much screen time? Are you getting too much uh, easy access to carbohydrates, et cetera? Is it possible to do some kind of a fast or a dopamine fast? So the dopamine fast is probably the quickest way these days to get people out of depression. Basically tell them, okay, your phone, put it on the other, put it, put it on the other side of the house, give your phone to someone and, and tell that person to hide that phone, that phone from you. Um, and what you'll often find is that that you know for someone who was not able to get out of bed for a week suddenly they're out of bed very very quickly. Um, so getting rid of those dopamine triggers, uh, especially in terms of the phone, but also just increasing uh, the time between meals and fasting in general. Um, so um, yeah, getting out in the fresh air also super super, uh, super helpful. Sunlight, talking with friends. Um, fasting is important because when we're not eating, our body can actually become more active. So again, we think from a um, biological point of view, if humans um, 100,000 years ago, if for some reason you weren't eating, the body would get pretty anxious pretty fast. It would, it would sort of make you say, oh, you got to get up, you got to hunt, you got to do some hunting, right? So you can hack into this. You can try and do a day-long fast or longer, water only with electrolytes. 
Um, and um, I guarantee you, well, I don't guarantee you, but in most cases, you'll find that you are you are able to move. You're able to find that motivation. You're able to find that dopamine and you, you can move. Um, okay, so some general tips for resilience over time. Uh, over time, what we want to do is have the right habits in place to support our mental health. Um, and I'm saying habits very deliberately. So for example, some of the things we're, talk we're talking about here are cold exposure, heat exposure. Um, it's pretty easy to, as I mentioned, to, you know, at the end of a bath to, or at the end of a shower to put on the cold water exclusively just for a few seconds. And I'll tell you, it's not even that difficult. In the, you know, more than 30 seconds is difficult, but 30 seconds is pretty easy. So can we just turn that into a habit? Um, having friends is great. Having a support network is great. Um, but what can you do today to nourish those relationships, to support those relationships? What habits can you inculcate uh, today in order to keep that insulin resistance uh, at bay? So remember, I talked about the three ways to eat. Um, you want to prioritize protein, you want to reduce carbohydrates, and you want to um, not fear fat, dietary fat. Um, so if we put all these things together, so I've just given you the checklist for food, but there's, there's other checklists. If you put all that together, you can come up with a longer list for things you could be doing every day or every week to support your mental health. Um, lastly, um, I think we need systems in place to minimize our mental stress. Um, so I think we've just begun to talk about, you know, sort of very basic checklists, but we're all gonna have to have individual checklists or systems in place, depending on our own needs and relationships, right? So for example, we just had a very bizarre, but kind of big earthquake here. I think it was around four on the Richter scale. Um, here in Johannesburg, we never get earthquakes. Like it's a very rare thing. It's not supposed to happen. Um, but now that it's happened a couple of times, we have to sort of say, okay, well, it's not supposed to happen, but it's happening. So you better have some kind of a kit ready. Are you know what's going to happen? Are you ready? If the house is shaking, you're gonna you're gonna grab a suitcase and run out. What does that suitcase have in it? Right? You need to ask yourself those questions. So we need um, you need to have an emergency preparedness strategy. Um, it's also you know you need to have systems in place. Uh, does your next of kin, does your spouse, does your brother, your mother, your, your sister, whoever it may be, do they know where your Facebook passwords are, right? I mean, I don't know, I'm picking something arbitrarily, but what would that person need to know if for some reason you, you know, you couldn't pick up your phone, you were immobilized or, you know, heaven forbid you passed away. What does that person need to know? And is that, are those plans in place? Um, so these are just some, some basic, um, top level thoughts on mental health. We can go deeper on any of these issues in the question and answer if you if you'd like. So uh, thank you. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Shireen. Thank you so much, Samir. Um, you covered a lot of ground uh, in about 45 minutes um, uh, and including tips on how to have better mental health. Um, all of us at some point or another have suffered um, mental health issues. We have suffered from mental health issues. Some of us have had complete breakdowns as well. And especially people who are involved in um, changing the world, changing mindsets, change, changing attitudes, uh, trying to bring about political change. Um, we feel very deeply and often we don't have anyone we can share our troubles with because <laughs> we are sharing the troubles of the world. So, um, you know, this, this session was really meant to help all of us there to have some sort of support, to have uh, a few guidelines that we can follow uh, in order to have better mental health. Thank you, Shakir. Um, so now we are open for questions and answers. Um, you can either put your questions in the chat or the question answer um, option that's given, or you can use the microphone and Samir will be answering uh, those questions. Thank you. Um, there are some questions already in the chat. And if people are still getting, you know, everything together and trying to see what they want to ask, I can take those questions first. Uh, Samir, what is your uh, suggestion? Yeah, please, please do. Uh, if we have questions, let's hear them. Okay, so um, one question, I think it was um, from... 
uh, Mitsu, it was that, you know, when you are too depressed, uh, Mitsu asked if it's very hard to exercise. Uh, Mitsu is referring to exercise. If you are deeply depressed, don't even get up to eat, then, you know, how can you do it? So that was one question. No, I think I think it's absolutely true. And I think um, those of us who have who've, um, struggled with depression sort of know that feeling very intimately. Um, you know, so so I, I take the point. I think the point was that not everyone can go straight to exercise. 100% correct. And in that case, what we would do is we would try and say, okay, what is actually going on here? Why, you know, is it, you know, is it diet? Is it is it mood? Is it is it something that's happened, right? If, if um, you know, someone's had a death in the family that's a week old, that kind of reaction is perfectly normal. Um, but if that death in the fact in the family happened a year ago, then maybe we need to do something about it, right? So, I, I think the the point that there's a lot of nuance and you can't always recommend the same intervention for everyone. 100% well taken, 100% correct. For that person who's um, having so much depression that they can't get out of bed even to uh, eat, um, I mean, yeah, we we would uh, you know we would see what had to be done. I mean, it, maybe picking up the phone and talking to a friend is is the right approach. Um, maybe going on that longer fast is the right approach. You know, it's hard to say without knowing more about the case. But I, I take the point that the same intervention will not be applicable to everyone. Hundred percent correct. Okay, then um, Shamsu says, Sami, thanks for enlightening on the issue of mental health. It is a problem wider than COVID-19. And I have another question from Anand uh, sent directly to me about COVID-19. Actually, he says that COVID-19 has made mental health worse. For him, he already had some issues. It's become worse during COVID um, and that it is very important to take care uh, of of that. Uh, so it's not really a question, but a comment and it's related to COVID-19. Um, Kim says, thank you, love the breathing. I took an anxiety class and, and that's one thing that has helped so much. It was also recommended to practice when you aren't anxious so that you can train your brain and that's what you do when you're relaxed. So it helps when you're at a higher level of anxiety. Samir, uh, your comments on 100% that? agreed, 100% agreed. These are all things that we learn in order, um, you know, if you think about this, like uh, I'm not a I'm not a hugely athletic person, but if you think about it, if you think about say a, a sports person, um, when they are playing a match, they're playing under intense pressure, and it's very difficult for them to make a shot. That's why they do 99% of their playing they do not in a match format, right? They're practicing with a coach, they're practicing with you know a partner who's just giving them very easy balls to hit, and so on. So in the same way, we must train our mental health. We must get good at these techniques, not in the context of crisis, in the context of everyday living, so that when the crisis comes, then we are, you know, it's second nature to us. We don't need to think, you know, when, when that tennis player gets a really, really difficult uh, ball, it's second nature to them to go and hit it and fight, to run to it and hit it back, right? Even though it's a very, very difficult thing to do. So for us, it must be second nature, those kind of techniques, breath work, whatever else it may be. Um, uh, also, I want to point out that uh, what we have started doing in our uh, discussion circles at Peace Vigil is because we discuss some very tricky subjects and people can have very, um, you know, heartfelt reactions about things and discussions can get quite hot. <laughs> so before every session, we do breath work together so that we are more in control and that we can have an argument or debate um, while keeping our sanity. And, you know, then it doesn't turn into just a shouting match <laughs> of some kind. Um, one thing that um, is, is raised here is um, brain inflammation. Um, yeah. It's just a brain inflammation question mark. Yeah. 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 So if we, it's, it's a difficult thing to answer because, when you're taking something like um, say alcohol or a drug or something like this, or a lot of sugar, um, there, the inflammatory pathways are triggered in the brain. Um, but if you look at the brain of someone who suffers from obesity, so, so the head may be bigger, um, but the brain will be smaller. The brain actually contracts over time. So I don't know if we wanna use the term, people, the, people do use the term brain inflammation. I don't know that it's hundred percent accurate to talk about it that way. There's a lot of different pathways that are leading to a lot of different problems. Um, and in the case of this metabolic dysfunction, um, it's not so much, the inflammation may be a problem, but it's also the fact that 
the body's never getting a, a chance to recover from that inflammation. So we all have inflammation on, on a daily basis, but for most of us, it's like, you know, so for example, when you eat, eating is something that no matter what you eat will cause some inflammation, but then most of the day you're not eating. So you're healing from that inflammation and you're totally fine. Right. But for the person who is suffering from these metabolic dysfunction, that little bit of inflammation that's healthy is never getting, never getting healed. And so it, it builds up, builds up, builds up. And this may be, you know, when we talk about Alzheimer's disease and, and the, the plaques that can build up in Alzheimer's disease, inflammation may be one of the reasons that that's happening. And, and in a, in many people, that may be just part of a healthy response, but in people who have metabolic dysfunction, that, that may not be healthy. Uh, I'm coming to Kyle now. Um, uh, uh, Kyle asks if CBD uh, trend um, is something that's useful or is it overblown? Your thoughts on CBD? But here I just want to point out that depending on which country you are, please be mindful of what you're using and you know where you're using uh, things yeah. like in South Africa, uh, you know it is allowed. In some countries, it is not. So wherever you're joining from, please the advice that is being given here has to be taken um, in relation uh, with whatever your country's laws are. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so listen, this is one of those things where I'm looking at the research and I'm not finding conclusive evidence one way or another. I have a lot of issues with um, so so CBD obviously is evolved is 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 derived from cannabis, and what I see with um, cannabis users is is a lot of imbalances, um, vitamin imbalances, mineral imbalances. So I I don't you know if we're talking about cannabis and marijuana in general, I would say uh, if you can stay away, it's much better. If you can't, then give me a call. Let's talk about it. We can we can make a plan. Um, CBD, it's definitely overblown. Um, is it a little bit useful? I can't really tell based on what I'm seeing. So, it, you know, my answer to this is how I answer about most supplements. Um, can supplements play a role? Maybe, but it's maybe five or ten percent of the equation. Eighty or ninety percent of the equation is is food and exercise and sleep and all the other things that we've gone over. Um, if you're doing all that stuff, if you're not, for example, if your sleep isn't optimized and your gym routine is not optimized and your diet isn't optimized then I think the CBD is not going to help you. Um, if all that's working and you still feel like you're not sleeping well enough, for example, then there is some data indicating that CBD may help with sleep. But I would say you got to get everything else right first and then experiment with supplements in general and that supplement in particular. Um, Neelima says, Samir, I learned breathing exercises while attending your lecture on the same issue in Hindi. It has helped me immensely. Thanks to you and Peace Vigil for discussing an issue which, though an epidemic, we are shy of discussing. Thank you, Neelima. Uh, Kim says, uh, when you talk Bernard, about- I think you missed something from- Sorry to, sorry uh, to interrupt. You know, I'm, I'm, I, no, I'm giving people a chance who have not been given the chance. Oh, okay. so I'm taking the questions first. Um, when you talk about low carb, do you mean any or more of the processed refined carbs? Yeah, so, so I think there's- um... The, the answer, as I, as I sort of mentioned when I went over the data, the, the, the data, it depends on where you are in your journey. So if you feel like you your mental health is great and you just want to maintain, then I think you can do fine just focusing on removing processed foods, junk foods, et cetera, which frankly are not, they shouldn't be considered food. I, I consider them highly toxic food-like substances. Yeah. So, so if you just remove those and you're doing fine, then that's great. But you know, if you look at the data in terms of actually improving mental health outcomes, you have to go to an extremely low carb diet. So it's not about the carbs, it is about changing the metabolism. Remember we're talking about mental health as a function of um, metabolic dysfunction. So we need to change the metabolism. We have to get people away from burning carbohydrates for fuel, which may not be a bad thing for most people, but for people with mental illness is a bad thing. So we need to get them away from burning those carbohydrates for fuel. And the only way to do that is to go to a diet that is 70, you know, you know, you gotta be pretty strict with these ratios too. I'm, I'm gonna forget, forget it off the top of my head, but I think it's at least 65% fat, 20% protein, and no more than 15% carbohydrates, something like that. And, you know, for my clients, for if we wanna do that, we that's a little hard to track. I just say, okay, can we keep your carbohydrates to less than 50 grams total carbohydrate um, in the day, which, Many people can do, at least for a short period of time. And then once you've done that for a few days and you see the benefits, I mean, the benefits are almost 
instant instantaneous in terms of mental health benefits in a day or two people who you know they they've never they can't remember what it feels like to um the feel <laughs> they feel like they're they've been on these antidepressants so long and their emotional range has been so sort of choked they, they don't know what it's like to not feel this panic and anxiety or, or to people who have depression don't know what it's like to really feel anything at all and then you give them a new way of eating and within 48 72 hours they're experiencing things they haven't experienced in years that's a very powerful intervention so so i can't answer the question generically it just depends on who you are and what your goals are but if, if you're we're talking about the science behind improved outcomes it has to be an extremely low ca carbohydrate diet so i'm going to now take a question from shakir and then go back to mitsu and then there's a question on facebook um shakir uh, says i didn't know about the eating inflammation connections related question i keep hearing of people wanting anti-inflammatory foods can you suggest easy foods or natural herbs remedies that would be convenient yeah so so anyone who's trying to talk to you about anti-inflammatory foods chances are they don't know what they're talking about because all food causes some kind of inflammation, like 100% of it, right? So so what do they mean, right? I think we can talk about foods that um, are... No, man, for me, it's very simple. It's about, it's about not eating the foods that are aggravating your condition. So what we often find is that people, uh, for example, on a vegetarian diet, um, they're having all kinds of symptoms, but they're still eating the same thing every day by day after day after day. So if you're if you know that you're having you know dal chawal and sabzi so so lentils rice and two or three vegetables spinach potatoes um you know cauliflower you know th these two or three dishes are just on rotation and you and they're causing you big problem i mean and you're suffering mental health issues or they're causing inflammation and i'd say look fast <laughs> don't eat those things for a few days see how you do and by the way when you start eating again how about you mix up your diet don't eat those things if you can introduce meat and eggs and milk, then do that. Those are going to be less inflammatory for most people. Milk may be an exception. Milk can, you know, a lot of people don't react well to milk. But egg yolks, um, beef, uh, mutton. Paneer? Uh, paneer, paneer for, paneer for, for people. For, uh, like a, from, unfortunately, many people do have a lactose. Many people who we see with symptoms do not do very well with lactose. So I would say, depends. If you can tolerate paneer, great. Um, but unfortunately, many people cannot. Um, if you can tolerate the egg whites, great. Unfortunately, many people can't. So we just have to do the egg yolks. Yeah. If you can tolerate fish and sea and other kinds of seafood, great. Uh, so, you know, it, it really, it becomes very individualized, but I think anyone who talks about anti-inflammatory foods doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, and especially herbs and so on. Like I, like I was telling uh, the previous, uh, I think it was Kyle who asked that question about CBD oil. The herbs and remedies, yeah, there are a couple things like there's um, berberine, tree turmeric is something that has been shown to have sort of anti-inflammatory prop properties, especially when it comes to heart disease. But again, that's like five or 10% of the, you know, at, at most it's going to move the needle two or 3%, I would say. The big things you can do, fasting, diet, exercise, these are sleep, optimizing sleep. These are massive things you can do. The supplements and the herbs and so on, very, very tangential, small, small things you can do. Don't have as big an impact. Okay, uh, Mitsu is the one who had asked a question about if if someone's very depressed and they can't exercise, um, can they go to diet first? Is Mitsu's question? Yeah, listen, with these kind of clients, we have to ask what they're ready for. You know, it, it really depends. You know, and um, if they're not sleeping well, that's probably or you know, sleeping too much. That's probably where we'll go first. We'll try and we'll try and optimize the sleep. So we'll try and go and get them out in the sun um if it's at all possible uh if the sun's not possible we might try heat exposure cold exposure so what i would do with such a client is i just give a number of options food may be one um but often what i find with that kind of client is they want something a little bit more dramatic um and sunlight on the body can be quite dramatic so you know little things and then you know for me it's about establishing a relationship with a client whereby they trust me so if i if i tell them you know, go if, if you have access to a sauna, spend five minutes in the sauna, and then they come back the next day and they say, wow, I really love that five minutes in the sauna. They're going to be more likely to trust me if I suggest something like, okay, we need to greatly reduce your carbs. Because otherwise, if I tell someone who's addicted to potato chips, 
that I want to take those potato chips away from me, they're just not going to want to talk to me again. <laughs> so it's it's a it's a difficult conversation. Um, some of these, and we have to move baby steps. We have to move our 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 friends and ourselves. We have to be gentle with ourselves too, and take baby steps towards our destination. Uh, Samir, the question on um, uh, Facebook is about fats. What exactly do you mean by fats that our ancestors would recognize, as you mentioned? Yeah, um, I was trying to avoid this question, <laughs> but okay, let me not avoid it. So, so um, there have been, um, in the last 50, 60 years, actually, that's not true, last 140 years, so 18, in the 1880s, a process was um, invented whereby uh, industrial sorry, waste... Sorry, I, I, ha I have to intervene here. Why is it that all the bad things <laughs> started at around 140 years ago? I'm thinking of the RSS too, right? What, what, yeah, what, an interesting... like, no, that was more like 100 years. Yeah, but still, yeah, yeah. It's an interesting point. No, no, I mean, it's it's that same late British, you know, dominant period, but this was happening in the US. It, so in the US, there was something that happened whereby, um, oh, the invention of the light bulb, that's what happened, whereby, um, so prior to the invention of the light bulb, there was uh, the cotton industry. So the US, of course, um, became the US, it became this industrial powerhouse through the, the use of enslaved people to produce cotton, right? Uh, cotton had this thing, had these seeds. If you've ever seen cotton in its raw form, I know you have, seen many in India will have seen, you go through the fields and you see, there's the fluffy stuff, which is cotton, but there's also these black seeds. Those black seeds are useless. They, they can't be used uh, for in the cotton process in making clothes. So they get cast aside. Now, they wanted to make money with that, so they turned that into oil. That oil was used for industrial processes. It was used especially to, um, to light, can light lamps. So the oil lamps in London and in all these places, you would go and, and you would have someone who would actually light the thing physically. Okay, electric light bulb comes around in the 1890s, puts that street lamp. Uh, the street lamp was a problem because you could also start a fire, right? So it, it's much safer, electric lighting, much safer than this, um, this uh, lighting things by hand. The problem is what do you do with the cotton oil? And it was discovered you could you could do something hydro hydrogenate this cotton oil and turn it into something that looked like lard, or and it can be even be mixed with butter. So at a certain point, I want to say around 1915, um, exports of butter and lard from the U.S. to Canada and Europe were barred because they were all contaminated with this cottonseed oil, which was not approved for human consumption. Okay. Now, when we're talking about that process, when we talk about our modern day oils, sunflower oils, canola oils, etc. They're made with exactly the same process. Now, there is some debate as to whether those things are healthy or not. Mm, I, without entering, I, I can give a long lecture on this and I don't really want to right now. Without entering into that debate, let me just say this. There is no doubt that um, the, the epidemic of modern diseases that we've seen has come after the introduction of that. Now, it may not be causation, it may be correlation. So. But there's no doubt that those the entry of that in the 1920s correlates with a rise in obesity, heart attacks, uh, mental health disorders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No doubt at all about that. That's that's 100% documented, right? So given that that's the case, wouldn't it be more sensible to try and find those fats that existed prior to 1880, which is your lard, your beef tallow, your butter, olive oil, yes, maybe co coconut oil, yeah, um, maybe palm oil. Palm oil in West Africa was a very co popular thing as well. So so I'm not saying only um, animal-based fats. Animal-based fats plus uh, what, some of these what traditional What about oils. the must mustard seed oil that is traditionally mustard used? Mustard seed oil is in fine. India. So in India, we still have this tradition that you can take a bag of seeds and go and see someone press it, right? So that, that's totally fine because that's not going through this this crazy chemical process and deodorization, et cetera, et cetera. If you could do that even with, with your canola seeds, I would say that's still fine. The problem is, as anyone who's done that in India will know, those things go bad in about two weeks. Like they start smelling really rancid and they need to be thrown away if they're still there after two or three weeks. So um, so only the, so only if you can get fresh oil done, which for most people in the cities is not possible. They're buying stuff off the shelf. It's probably been sitting there for at least a few months, if not more. Yeah. And, and what I would say is also there's no, you know, like everything here, it's about baby steps. So if you're eating, if you're eating a lot of those oils, maybe just cut it down a little bit and, and slowly, you know, introduce more 
of the ghees of the um you know in india ghee will be the main thing that people are using and that's totally fine and and the best thing of course just from an ethical point of view in in my opinion is you get to know the farmer you get to understand where the, the ghee is coming from or you know a dairy cooperative or something you can send emails and, and you don't have to know them personally but you should at least know what's going on um as much as possible of course it's you know this, uh, we're living in the real world with constraints so i'm not saying everyone can do this but if you can making a trip to your local farm if you can talking to your local farmer it would be a great thing to do so that you're you know the quality of those things that are coming that you're consuming and of course as local as possible is also is also a good a good bonus okay satinder bhagat ji had to leave uh, but he has sent a message saying thank you and god bless for sharing very important ideas to keep our mental health from going astray he just had to leave just now but he sent this message anybody else guys um uh, anybody with any more questions i think i did cover everything that came through um but if i missed anything please do uh, remind me if there are no more questions i can give a few um parting thoughts if you like yeah. i think that's a great idea but if people do think of something um uh, thank you shakir um yes yes i think it does make a lot of difference to reach out to others i just want to point out here that at peace vigil we are trying to build a, a community where we can um give each other support even if you're not part of peace vigil uh, if you lack that support you can write to us and we can try and find people in your city or in your area uh, that you can go and talk to um resources are often a problem so not everyone can afford um a therapist or um, a person they can work with on their diet and and exercise and so on so we can you know try and do what we can uh, but but uh, i will be sending a follow up email in a day or two and um i will put you on our newsletter list uh, of course if you don't like our work or you don't not interested in our stuff you can always opt out but i'm just letting you know that you know we will keep you in the loop and if there are follow up questions do send them um to my email uh, so yeah i think some it's a good idea to uh to have some last thoughts here to help yeah. people also shakir says that i have found it uh i i found i have found that it helps a lot to speak out openly about everything we feel and understand right future fantastic so so um let me begin again by thanking everyone for for coming i think this has been a good uh, discussion um couple of closing thoughts so, so the first clo closing thought is please do take a look at the slide and think about how you can um, take action so at peace vigil we're really about you know helping people to take action to promote um you know peace and uh harmony and their own mental well-being as well so do think about one thing you can take away from this lecture and and implement in your life please um th this i mean i i think the thing to end on is just you know there are um there are the things that can move the needle a lot. We we touched this. We touched on this a little bit during the Q and A. There are things that move the leader needle a lot, and the things that move the needle just a little bit. And you know, if you look at at what we've discussed here, the things that move the needle a lot really it's it's about exercise, it's about diet, it's about sleep, right? If you can choose your action that you're going to do from today, if you can make it relevant to one of those three things. You are going to have such a massive. You're going to make such a massive difference um, to your own life, and and by extension, you know we're all modeling for other people as well. So when we improve our own life, we improve the lives of many others as well. Some we may not even see. Um, so I would encourage you to think in terms of what are those big interventions that I can do um, that will have a big, big um, make a big, big difference, right? So just to give uh, an example for me, um, you know I, I mentioned um, the hot exposure. Uh, the cold exposure, um, those are also super important, but it's actually much more important in my case to sort of um, end my reliance on sweet stuff and my sort of addiction with sweet stuff. Um, so today I usually have, you know, I had lunch today. It's not a fasting day for me. I usually have um, one date. So a date is a, you know, to other people, this may not sound like a big deal, but a date for me is a big treat. And it's a treat that I, I really shouldn't allow myself as much as I have. And I was really feeling um, after lunch, my habit is I have something, I end with something sweet. 
And I was able to sort of forego that today. Small thing, um, but I'm feeling a kind of mental clarity. I'm not having that high sugar fruit that I sometimes have um, that I probably wouldn't have had without the, without that. So just these little things, like you think, okay, it's it's like six grams of carbohydrate in, in one small fruit and it's a whole food is a natural thing. But for me, I'm feeling already that that's made a difference. So I think you guys ask yourselves, what's one thing you can do, one simple thing you can do that'll just make a big difference uh, in, how, in how you're feeling. Um, so with that, thanks everyone. Um, yes, you, uh, uh, just a few last things, please. Um, definitely, um, Shakir, uh, we hope to also see you again. Uh, Mitsu, in the email, it will not be possible for us to send the whole presentation because it becomes too heavy. But what I would recommend if you want to look at the slides is to just go on our Facebook page, uh, which is called Peace Vigil, and you will find all the slides there, but also join Good Things Happen Too. Let me just write it down here. It's very easy to join. It's a small group. Um, good Things Happen Too on Facebook. Uh, many people here on this um, uh, call are also there. I will accept your um, request there because now I, I know your name. Uh, so it is called Good Things Happen To on Facebook by Shamsul. Have a good night. And also I've written uh, my email address here, shireen at peacevigil.net. Uh, if there's any confusion, you can send me an email. Melissa says, thank you so much for the information, the support and the feeling of community. Thank you so much, Melissa. Kim says, thanks, Shireen and Samir. Important information and discussion. Kim, we are very happy you, you liked it. Um, so guys, uh, just, just as a reminder, this, this was a, a, a short training to give people some guidelines um, as to how they can improve their mental health. Um, you know, if you need more support, uh, send us an email. Uh, and if you don't have support in your area, then we can find um, some resources perhaps, um, uh, you know, that can help you. Uh, in that regard, whether it's therapists or doctors or so on. Um, of course, you know, there are also Peace Vigil volunteers all over the world and you can connect with them. Um, the, the last thing is that you will get an email from me, a follow-up email. And as I said, if you don't want to hear from us about our work and so on, you can always opt out. Uh, but thank you so much, everyone, for coming and spending about um, an hour and 20 minutes with us. Um, and uh, I wish you all the best and may peace with, be with you all wherever you are in the world. Thank you.